Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Adventures of a Real Estate Investor. I'm Susie. You know, I'm Michael, and we're excited you joined us for this adventure. So today's very special guest is Fred Moskowitz. Thank you so much for joining us today, Fred. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, we are super excited to have you on, super excited to have an investor that's like kind of nearby to us the next day. It's like the first time we've ever been able to say that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. We just moved back from the United Kingdom. So yeah. Uh, now we're, awesome. uh, we're back stateside, which is nice. But we're also excited to have you on the show because I think this is only the second time we've had somebody on that is that is a node investor specifically. And so I think that's a, a nice little treat for our adventurous family or listeners out there. So stay tuned if you're interested in <laughs> node investing. But before we get started with the details and nitty gritty about node investing and some other things we'll talk about in the show, Fred, would you mind sharing with our adventurous family a little bit more about your background and why you started investing in real estate? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you, Michael. A little bit about me. I started out having a really long and successful career working as a computer engineer. I spent a lot of time working at technology startup companies, and I loved it. I loved it so much. It was so exciting. I, I actually got to experience the birth of the internet and I was involved in that. Yeah. But what, what happened was during this time, it was super exciting, but then I got, I saw my entire industry get turned upside down because of the bursting of the dot-com bubble. Yeah. Right. And right around the same time, we had the September 11th terrorist attacks. And so that caused a lot of turmoil in the world and the technology sector got hit really hard around that time. And so what I experienced was that I realized I was way too dependent on the income from my job. And I was taking on this huge risk because my paycheck for my engineering job was the only income I had. And I realized no matter that there I realized there were so many circumstances outside of my control and no matter how talented of an engineer I was or how valuable of an employee I was, right? If things were not going well financially at the company, I would lose my job through no fault of my own. And so that caused me to do a lot of deep and internal searching to see how can I develop other sources of income, mm -hmm. right? And that led me to investing in assets. I knew that if I invested in assets, that that would generate income for me. And I started out by investing in real estate. I knew a lot of people that had done very well with it. And I saw that it was a long-term play. And so with that, I started building a rental portfolio. And in here in, in Philadelphia, where I'm based out of, I did really well with that. And after a few years, I started learning about investing in notes and, and I transitioned into that. And we can talk a little bit more about what note investing is. I think that will help, help the audience, but that's really how I got my start. And, you know, real estate's not the only asset. There's so many different types of assets, but it's about investing in something that generates income for you. So that you get paid while you wait, while you have ownership, it's generating income from you. And that's something I feel is so important. No, it totally is. And something that kind of stood out to me, or like my first thought was like, with your career, I'm sure you were super, 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 super busy, you know? So like you hear, or I hear often, like a lot of people saying like, I'm too busy, you know, to either learn about investing or start something new. How did that work for you personally? Like, I know, I'm sure a big driver was that like your job, like you mentioned, like if you did lose it, it wasn't at your fault, right? Like it, the company can change at any moment and that's what yeah. does it. So like, was there an, any other driving factors where you're like, no, like it's worth all of the extra work that I have to put in to like learn about this, to have more security in my future? Yeah, absolutely. It, the other factor for me was seeing people that I knew personally that held real estate for a very long time and they did very well, very well. People, these are people, salt of the earth, 
folks that they didn't come from any means, financial means, but they were able to build great wealth through real estate. And that was very appealing to me. I said, this is, this is something that, that can really work. And something else I realized about that time was I, I was learning. I studied so much on my own about investing. And I learned that the tax advantages from real estate are second to none, second to none. And let's face it, our government here, they incentivize two activities two activities. And the first one is to own rental real estate. And the second one is to own a small business. And they incentivize these two activities right in the tax code because of all the tax advantages and the deductions. And so they want to encourage as many people as possible to do that. And so what I found was super powerful was that owning real estate and working a W-2 job at the same time was giving me all these tax advantages and lowering my taxable bracket. And that was powerful because now that was money that normally would be going to taxes. Now it was coming to me and I could reinvest that and carry on my mission at an even faster pace. And that's so powerful. And so I always tell people, look at this. Because the government incentivizes these two things, start a business on the side or invest in real estate. And if you do that, you're entitled to a lot more deductions and a lot of flexibility. And in the end, isn't that what, what we all want is to have flexibility, have options in life. It's the best thing. Totally. <laughs> it really is. I love that. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally agree with you, Fred, on that. I do, I do have some questions about your past. So like you said, you started getting in, you know, involved in real estate. You said rental properties. Do you mean like single family homes? Is that where you guys started in? Like collecting single family yep. homes? Sing, single family home and multifamily as well. Both, both a really powerful asset class. Yes. And then what made you transition now? And do you still have, you know, some some single family home rentals or are you now all doing note investing and what? No, it's, it's a mix. It's a mix now. Now, now today my focus is on note investing yet. I, I do have real estate investments. I'm not really adding to that. I do, I do participate by investing in deals that someone else manages and operates like syndication or partnerships and those type of things where I'm not actively doing the work. Cause I don't have time, but I do like the asset class and continue. There's tons of opportunities out there, tons. And so, so many different, different ways. And so I always tell people, find the way that's right for you. Not everyone is going to like owning, owning homes and renting them and all the, it's a lot of work. It, it yeah. is. There's some risk. There's some work. There's some sleepless nights for sure. Yeah. But it, and it's not for everyone for, so for some people. They prefer to buy real estate and turn it over to someone else to manage it for them or do short-term rentals in a vacation area, things like that. I like re real estate deals where it's professionally managed by someone that's, this is their expertise. They are, they're good at that, right? I love investing, for instance, I'll invest in a 500 unit apartment complex, right? I don't personally have the bandwidth or the expertise to operate that type of an asset, but other people do. That's what they're focused on. That's their unique ability. And so I rather join into a partnership with them where they operate it and I earn part of the cash flow and part of the ownership benefits. And that's, that's working for me now. And so that allows me to focus on my business and my expertise, which is in node investing, investing in the debt side of real estate. Yeah, can you explain a little bit more about notes and then like why you chose them? Yeah, absolutely. Node investing is basically stepping into the shoes of the bank, owning the notes, the mortgages that are part of real estate transactions. And let's face it, a lot of people invest in, in real estate, whether it's single family homes or commercial property or multifamily, but not too many investors talk about investing in the paper. 
the notes and the mortgages that are associated with those properties. And this is such an interesting part of the real estate business. And so many real estate investors that I know, they don't pay any attention to this. When they think of a note and a mortgage, they think of being the borrower and not as being the lender. But with note investing, you lay your capital out, you buy an asset, you buy the note, and this allows you to step across the aisle and become the bank because now you've transitioned from being the one making the monthly payments to being the one receiving the monthly payments. And that gives you very predictable cash flow when you do that. Yeah, that's awesome. So further questions about this, of course, I got several questions because I don't talk about this often. Yeah. So do you, as the bank, you said you're acquiring these notes. Do you, you know, do you take on new notes? Like if somebody come to you and you be providing the senior debt on a property? So for a new note, or do you look for like underperforming or delinquent notes and then, and then purchase those from the bank and then take over and then how's it, how's all yeah, that? Yeah, the, those are all different models and niches okay. within note investing. So all of those things that you mentioned can be done. It comes down to what you want to specialize in and what your risk tolerance is. I like... So since you're asking about me, I like buying notes that have a good track record that already have been originated and there, there's some seasoning behind them. And so I look to buy those who buy them at a discount for less than the amount owed. And that increases the rate of return on the notes. But there's all kinds of notes. There's residential notes. There's commercial notes. Right. If you're familiar with, with real estate investing, hard money lenders, right? Those are another form. That's another form of note investing. They're originating those notes. They're high interest rate, short term, usually six to 18 months in length. And then the, they get cashed out and move on to the next deal. So there's really many, many options and different ways to do it. What I like personally is buying notes that are already originated. They're sold on the secondary market. And so we, we periodically will buy those. That's what we like. Could you explain a little bit further, just to give like an example to our listeners out there, like how, first of all, like, how do you find these seasoned performing notes that you buy on the secondary market? Like, and then like, what are we looking at? Like typical, could you give us like a whole example, like typical, you know, the note you would carry, like how much you'd have to, you know, what the note's for, how much you'd have to invest to purchase it. And then like, what kind of returns you're looking at? I know everyone's different, but like just a, yeah. just an example for our listeners, because this might be a little difficult to wrap your head around to actually what's going on here. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, and like you said, <clears throat> there's so many different scenarios. There's nothing typical or customary. So some rules of thumb. The bottom line is the, if you want low risk, a low risk note that's super safe, you're going to be getting a lower rate of return, mm -hmm. which might be in the range of five or 6% on your money. If you're willing to take on more risk or more problems or both, you can get a really high rate of return in the area of 14 to 16% or higher even is possible. Mm -hmm. So it, it comes down to your risk tolerance and your level of expertise because a lot of notes can be bought that have different types of problems. Could be problems with the documentation, the origination of the note that needs to be corrected. There could be title issues. There could be notation issues. There could be an issue with the borrower, the payment history, reliability, different things like that. And all of these problems can be resolved in one form or another. It just takes some time and money to invest into it. But this allows you, you can buy an asset at a lower price, do the work, and then increase the value. And you're, you're making that cash flow all along the way. And so that, that gives you an idea. And there's different ways to invest in notes. You can invest in buying individual notes one at a time or small group portfolio of them, 
or you can invest in in a note fund where uh, the fund managers are raising capital, they're aggregating that together, and then they go out and buy notes in bulk quantity where they might buy 30 or 50 or 100 notes all at once. And what's nice about, nice about that is that your capital investment is now spread out over this population of notes and it results in better diversification and better risk management. Gotcha. Sorry, I got some more questions for you. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. That's, that's why we're here is to talk, yeah, yeah. Through, talk through the questions. Yeah. yeah so I'm just curious. Like, so say a bank is carrying a note and there's a $100,000 left from the principal to make it easy. And like you're saying you could buy these notes at a discount. Like why? So there's $100,000 left in a principal. Like why would a bank want to sell you that principal balance for like 90K? For example, yeah, um, very pop, it, very it's common. Like it's underperforming, where like they don't want to deal with it anymore, and they want to pass it off to you, you know, and then you can go in and like maybe maybe set up some different payment arrangements for the the person who owns a loan, or or how does this whole process work? I guess that's one of the possible reasons. Okay, but other reasons are the need for liquidity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Here's another one. Think about this: banks and there's banks and lenders that their whole business model and focus is on origination, okay? Michael and Susie, I'm sure you've experienced this or have heard about it or read about it, where someone will be a property owner, either they're buying a property or refinancing, go to closing, sign all the loan docs, and then within three to six months, I will say, get a letter in the mail from the bank saying, dear Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, please be advised, we have sold your loan. Mm -hmm. The new lender is so-and-so, here's their address, here's their contact information, and by the way, starting next month, please send your payments to them. And don't worry, the terms of your financing, your interest rate, none of that will change. Everything is the same yet. Starting next month, send your payments to them. This happens all the time. And the reason for this is that that lender wants to recuperate their capital so that they can go out, they're selling the note, recoup their capital, and then they're going to turn around and originate a new note. And they will sell that loan at a slight discount. Maybe they collected three or six or 12 payments, which by the way, are almost all interest because of the way the amortization schedule is. They'll sell it at a slight discount, but they made their money on the fees, on the points, on the origination costs that came up. And then they turn around and write a new loan. And they have a high volume, low margin model. And so this, this happens all the time. And those notes get packaged into a mortgage-backed security on Wall Street and it gets sold into a bond, into an investment. It sits there for a few years. And once the time frame for that bond runs out, the bond is collapsed. All the loans are now resold. They're going to be regraded because maybe the characteristics have changed since when it was originated. It's been a few years. And the loans will get sliced off and, and resold. So that is all what goes on behind the scenes in the secondary market. and reasons that investors sell loans is usually liquidity. Maybe they need the capital because they're going into another deal. They're doing another acquisition. Happens all the time. And that happens at any level, whether it's at the institutional level or at smaller funds or individual investors. Yeah. They need capital and so they'll sell some loans. Might not be anything wrong with the, the note. Not an issue. Nothing. But they're sold at a discount. And if someone needs capital quickly, they might be more aggressive on that. And so this happens all the time. And that's a big part of how the secondary market works. And for us node investors, it's the most important thing is about relationships. Everything is done through relationships. We're a small community. It's a couple hundred of us, right? We all know each other in the node investment industry. And so it's very easy to get phone calls from other investors. Maybe it's someone we transactioned business with in the past and say, hey, Fred, we had a good experience with you in the past. We have some loans for sale. 
Would you be interested in taking a look at them? And so it's about establishing and building those, those relationships. It's the most important thing. The most important skill as a node investor is to get good at that. Cool. So just to recap the example you gave us. So say, let's say a bank originates a loan for a hundred thousand dollars. They collect 15 grand on top of that for fees and every kind of that to close it points, stuff like that. So they're, they made $15,000 at closing. They've just put out a hundred thousand dollars in capital. Now they want that capital back. They sell it for 90 K. Uh, they yep. lost 10, 10 K on that, but they ended up making 5 K and they collected the 12 months of they interest. Collected 12 months of interest yeah. Only, or don't forget. Mostly, yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Totally understand that. So question, next question I have for you is obviously some of these notes could be, you know, 300, 400, 500, even million dollars, right? Like yes, even, even higher you yourself, like you're going and finding these notes and purchasing them. Obviously I'm, I'm sure you might bring on, or I'm not sure what kind of model you have. And this is where the question comes from. It's like, do you bring on other investors? Do you have, you know, a pool of investors that you kind of come together and you all pull up your capital, kind of like a syndication to mm -hmm. purchase that note or how does that work? That can ha that is a great, great model to do that. Pool raising capital in a fund and then going out and deploying it that way. What, what I like about that model is that you're buying at a higher volume. You're able to negotiate a better discount and have better access to notes to answer your question. So that is one way. And, and otherwise you do need cash. This is a cash and capital intensive business. So there's no financing. You can't use financing to buy a note unless you're leveraging a, a different asset you have already. So you do need cash for the transactions to close, but that's very common. You will see a lot of note funds that do this periodically. They raise capital from investors. They go out and then buy notes or they raise capital from investors and then they originate hard money loans for investors, for people doing fix and flip properties or different projects like that, or business purpose loans. So it's a very common model to see that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It is. I mean, it is cool. And it is fascinating just because like you mentioned at the beginning, so many people think that we're just on the other end when it comes to investing, right? That like, it's always just being the person who needs to borrow money, but being able to be, be the bank brings a lot of leverage like into your space, which is phenomenal as well. You know, like with no investing, well, and real estate investing, like there's just so much diversification because you're actually on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're totally right, Susie. You're, you're on, you're on both sides and, and that that's very powerful for sure. Very powerful. Think of this as really a diversification. If you're, you may be already involved in real estate, but why not think about having some note investment assets as well as part of your overall portfolio? What I like uh, about note investing is a couple of things. The first is that when you invest, your, your investment is always secured by a tangible asset that has value. So you're protected there right? The next one is that you can earn quite a high rate, high rate of return, as I mentioned earlier. And, um, the third reason is that it gives you a really good, really good diversification, which I think goes a long way towards risk management, because let's face it, when you get to a certain point in your life and in your career, you start to think more and more about preservation of capital yeah. instead of growth of capital. And you want a mix of both, I'd say. That's my own opinion, is have a mix. What the right ratio of that mix is will vary for each person and will change over time as well. But start out with diversity. I, I love diversifying into different assets, different types of, of industries. And so that if there may be a downturn in one area, there's opportunity and stability in another, and that's powerful. That's what helps you to sleep well at night. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one thing, one, one thing I wanted to point out here is like, 
it sounds like node investing provides a little, you know, not only, like you said, capital preservation, because you're placing your money somewhere that's backed by some tangible asset, like you mentioned, but then you're getting cash flow throughout it. So if somebody's looking for cash flow, this will be a great, you know, great investment for them. While well, like a syndication can also provide, you know, like a typical multifamily real estate syndication, let's say, can provide a little bit of cash flow throughout the deal. Might not be as high as, as node investing in some cases, depending on your risk level. But then you're also, you know, getting appreciation as well at the tail end of, of a real estate syndication. Yes. No, that's, that's very true. It's very true. And so why not have a mix of, of investments, right? It's, it's powerful. Yeah. And something, something else that came to mind that, that we didn't mention before you were asking about how to sources of capital for buying notes, because as I said earlier, they have to be bought all in cash. Well, a big part of what I love to talk about is about how to use retirement accounts for your investing, how to get familiar with self-directed IRAs and, and the different retirement vehicles, because a lot of people, what I find from talking to investors, a lot of people have that old 401k from a prior employer that they didn't take with them and it's still sitting there. Well, that capital can be put into a self-directed IRA. It's transferred over. You still maintain your tax benefits, but now it can be used to invest in real estate. You can buy rental property. You can invest in a syndication deal. You can invest in, in notes, mortgage notes, all of these assets. You can do business lending. And so that getting involved in that, now you're re really ramping up your rate of return by doing some of these other activities. And it's so powerful, so powerful. I feel that people just don't know about this. It's not something that's spoken in, spoken in about when you open up your 401k at work, the, the folks managing that plan, they're not going to tell you about this, yeah. but let's face it. It's right in the tax code. This is not a new thing. It's always been in there. The IRS doesn't tell you what you can invest your retirement account money in. They just put a few restrictions saying you can invest in certain things, can invest in collectibles like wine and sports cars. You can't invest in life insurance. Mm -hmm. You can't invest in activities that are federally illegal. Everything else is okay. And so that opens up. You can do rental property in your retirement account. You can own a note. You can invest in the local pizza shop in your town and buy their equipment, do an equipment lease for the pizza shop. So they can outfit their kitchen, commercial kitchen and ovens and all that. I love pizza. So <laughs> many, <laughs> yeah, so many possibilities. Are there are there. so many possibilities, yeah. actually, which is amazing. Yeah. Fred, it's been an absolute pleasure. We are getting towards the end of the show. Thank you for the information you provided so far. But before we end, we have four adventurous questions you'd like to ask all of our guests. So if you're ready, we will get started with those. Yeah, let's jump right in. Awesome. So the first question we have for you, Fred, is... Where is one place you wish to travel to and why? One place I wish to travel to and why? I wish to travel to the Mediterranean region. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. I love the food and I love the culture. And I, I love traveling in general. I think it's awesome way to get out of your environment, get into a new situation around different people, expand and, and clear your mind, especially if you're thinking about what do you want to do? What's the next thing you want to get involved in? You want to get clarity. Traveling to another place is a great way to do that. I always feel that money spent on travel is some of the best money you can ever spend. Yeah. We agree with that too. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Susie and I, we only spend money on two things, hard assets and experiences. It works. <laughs> That's great. So the second, that. thanks. The second question is, what is something on your bucket list and how are you leveraging real estate investing to achieve it? Or note investing. Yeah, just investing. Yeah, something on my bucket list is that I want to, I want to learn how to do kite surfing. Nice. That's awesome. And okay. so what is that going to involve? You have to travel to a place where you can do it, get equipment, get gear, 
get, get proper lessons and education, all of that. You know, every year I have a goal every year. I want to do something new, That's learn awesome. something new, learn a new skill, do a new activity. And for me, for this year, that's what it is. Last year, I'll tell you what I did last year. That was so much fun. I went and studied improv acting and nice. took lesson classes, improv acting classes. And it was so much fun. And I did that not because I wanted to be an actor, but I did it because it would make me a better speaker and a better communicator to think on your feet and be in the moment. And that's what improv is all about. And it, it was a wonderful experience. I met amazing people. I developed some new skills and I had fun at the same time. And that's beautiful. It's really cool. Yeah, it is really cool. I love that actually. So the third question we have for you, Fred, is what is one piece of advice for someone who wants to start passively investing in real estate? One piece of advice is invest in your education, invest in your education. I'm from Philadelphia. And so I will tip my hat to one of our founding fathers that I, I look to him as one of my heroes, it's Benjamin Franklin. Okay. He yeah. was a brilliant mind, brilliant man. And he left us with this quote that is so impactful. And it goes like this, an investment in knowledge always pays the highest dividends. Mm -hmm. And with that, always go out there, invest in yourself, take a class, listen to podcasts, go and attend workshops, travel to events and conferences where you're going to learn that's money well spent. And yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit of a heavy lift, right? Spending money to travel, spend taking a few days away from family to go somewhere else and, and be away, but you learn so much. And a side effect of that is the relationships that you build, because who else is going to be there? You're going to be in a room full of like-minded individuals mm -hmm. at a conference, at a workshop, and those can be lifelong relationships. It could be your next business partner. It could be the people in your inner circle and your support network that you bounce ideas off of that you transact business with in the future. And that's powerful. And so I always say that never, never be afraid to invest in yourself, no matter what you do, but in investing in the investing space that we're in, when you get out of your, out of your element and go attend a conference, go attend a workshop you're going to benefit on so many levels. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Like even when it comes to your confidence about like starting to invest to begin with in anything, right? You're like, oh, okay, like I understand what they're saying. Like I understand what I'm reading right now, right? So like it gives you the ability to even have more control and power on your end, right? And that makes a huge difference when it comes to. Yeah, confidence, mm -hmm. having confidence in yourself. That's very powerful. So then the fourth and final question is, if you had unlimited resources available to you, how would you leave an impact? Oh, I love this question. How would I leave an impact? I would leave an impact by sharing, sharing the knowledge, skills, ideas, and concepts that I've learned. And I don't need to wait for the money. I'm doing this now. Yeah. I do this every day and maybe it's not at a huge level, but I am doing it. I always love talking to investors that are just getting started, that are learning. I have my book on node investing, which gives a nice high level overview to people that want to learn, right? It's so easy to pick up a book, tune into a podcast and learn and go see good speakers at conferences and events. It's such a great way to learn and to get started. And so making an impact in that way through education, sharing ideas that spread, it's so powerful. And as I said earlier, there's no need to wait for having money or anything like that. We all have time. We can give, you can give money, of course, to help others, but you can also give of your time. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you putting your energy out there into the world, what I found is it always comes back to you. And usually it's in a different form than, than the way you put it out. It comes back in a different way, but it's such a powerful thing. And it's the best feeling to see other people that have learned from you do something with that knowledge, put it into action and change their lot, their own lives financially. It's powerful. And I find it so rewarding. It's incredible. Yeah, it is incredible because it's true, right? Like we, a lot of the resources we have are here. So thank you for sharing them because a lot of people 
don't do that. Yeah. And congratulations to both of you. Look at what you're doing with this podcast. How many thousands and thousands of people are downloading episodes, listening to them, learning, getting new ideas, getting exposed to different mindsets and different ways to approach problems and learning. It's all education and growth. And that's so powerful. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. Well, Fred, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, learning more about nodes. And I, I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing everything with us. Before we end the show, would you mind sharing with our listeners the best way they can get in touch with you or learn more about this, this book that you're talking about as well? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking. So my book is available on Amazon. It's called The Little Green Book of Node Investing. You'll find it there. And for anyone that wants to reach out, connect with me, you can do so by visiting my website, which is fredmoskowitz.com. However, if you prefer an easier spelling, you can go to gift from Fred. Dot com and that'll take you right to my website and I'll be happy to send out free special report about node investing to anyone that wants to request that. I love connecting with investors and invite you reach out, connect with me and we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I know. And thank you so much, Fred. And please, please, please do reach out. Like all of those links will be in the show notes so that you can find them easily. But like Fred mentioned earlier, like education and knowledge go so far. So please, please, please take the time to like talk to Fred and learn more about node investing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Well, until next time, explore more adventure awaits. Woo!